Hello, it's June 30th, 2014, and this is Chris Case from Open Mind Space. I want to talk today about protecting your health from government science, things to watch out for, and uh, how you can uh, get around all the bullshit and understand the nature of the information that's out there. And uh, the kind of food that's out there and why it's there. Now, I'm no nutritional expert. I just know about my own body and I pay attention to nutrition on the internet and I try to learn as much as I can. But uh, one thing that saddens me is the lack of knowledge that many people have with regards to nutrition and it's not always because they aren't looking a lot of times it's because much of the information that they've been given is fairly uh, inaccurate in, in terms of how the human body really works and how and what really is healthy for the human being um, as a result, I think many people are, they're either just trusting that the food that's available in society is good for them and safe, or that they, information from the government is accurate and, uh, you know, something that will promote their health and well-being. And I think in the process, many people are ill far more than they need to be as a result of this and I think that food is one of the primary drivers of health so if you don't have your food right if you're not eating the right food for your body and not pay, able to understand how it can affect your body so that you can react and, and make changes and whatnot and listen to your body then you're gonna be ill and Unfortunately, um, you know, a lot of people don't trust the government, but for some reason they trust the government's uh, science, uh, nutrition science and whatnot. And this is an unfortunate uh, area where it's almost like trusting a salesman because the advice that you get typically is going to be that which sells their favored, you know, clients' products. And so in this case, it would be the, the very people who are the largest players, the big agra companies, um, are going to want you to consume their products. And so if they can pull the wool over your eyes by uh, making recommendations through the state, uh, often these are revolving door regulators and whatnot uh, who have, have used to work or will, will in the future work for these companies, um, then they can fool a lot of people into buying something that uh, maybe if there was a more impartial scientific analysis uh, of, of what was going on, they would, they would likely make different decisions. So based upon my... Uh, own research, there are certain foods that uh, one should particularly be cautious about and just simply eliminating these foods or being careful not to eat too much of it can greatly, uh, you know, reduce your chances of getting various chronic degenerative diseases. There's a whole laundry list of diseases that you can, can get from eating some of these foods. And, you know, just the ones that come to mind offhand are uh, these canola products. There's a ton of stuff people don't understand about canola and many of the vegetable oils that are produced in North America, um, 
part of the reason why people eat these vegetable oils is because they're low fat and the reason uh, that they eat low fat is because they believe that a low fat diet is healthy uh, when in fact it isn't and this is something that is maybe it was okay research 30 years ago the low fat low cholesterol diet but it's been found that actually um, you can eat uh, quite a bit of saturated fat and cholesterol doesn't make a difference for the most part and uh, in doing so you're you're actually promoting your health that you need to burn fat that you don't need to be burning um, a ton of uh, carbs which is what people put in place uh, when they don't have enough fat is they start eating carbs and then they get all these uh, insulin related issues and there's a whole laundry list of problems that happens with that so these oils are are ridiculous and actually tropical oils which they had told you uh, in government science that uh, you should be wary of are actually quite good for you especially oils like uh, coconut oil uh, they're very high in, in saturated fat and uh, they also have a very high smoke point so you can cook with them and they're not going to get oxidized and give you all these you know issues related to having oxidized food in your body um, and they'll give you lots of good fats and you know there's just uh, a lot that can be done for you uh, by eating those kind of oils versus like canola oil and uh, soy oil and so on and when you eat these other kinds of oils uh, many of them promote inflammation they uh, I know soy uh, has a hormonal effect because it's kind of got an estrogen like uh, effect there's what do they call it phytoestrogens or something like that uh, you know I'm not gonna go into all the details but you can get a number of problems by you know eating this stuff and if you avoid it you know there's plenty of great alternatives you're not missing out on anything by avoiding these things uh, the only thing that you'd have to do really is just make sure that you um, are careful when you're buying things at the store because uh, most of the stuff at the store has uh, some kind of that, some kind of this crap in it, whether it be um, soy oil or canola oil or uh, corn syrup or something like that. So definitely something to be wary of. There's uh, quite a few details that one could um, go into in the, in regards to um, what kinds of foods to avoid and. Uh, to eat and, and so on and, and much of this is going to be uh, based upon your own metabolic type or you know other factors like that um, or your own health issues and conditions uh, there is I think a fair amount of uh, overlap though between people as to uh, foods that you should just not eat no matter what and you know things like donuts or pop tarts or you know soda I mean there's a lot of things that you could just eliminate and be much better off if I mean if you were regularly eating uh, donuts and drinking soda and and things of that sort like I used to drink a great deal of soda I used to have several sodas a week and uh, there's been some research done on soda that you know I can't quote the actual uh, outcome of it because I don't remember off the top of my head but there's a number of uh, diseases that you're put at risk for by simply drinking a soda a day even so it's something that's completely unnecessary and and can cause you a lot of problems and and diet soda is no better um, diet soda is actually worse in many ways and that's a big point of contention but um, at least based on my own research uh, the uh, artificial sweeteners are somewhat problematic uh, they can potentially cause uh, you know excito ex there's some kind of excitotoxin in them and cause you issues so uh, I prefer to just stay away from them maybe it's debatable but um, my my own preference in 
based upon my own research is that uh, eating something that's natural is preferable to eating something that is, uh, you know, some kind of synthetic chemical. Uh, I'd prefer to, if I'm going to, for instance, sweeten something, I'd rather use something like uh, stevia, which is based on a, a, you know, which is a plant, uh, than something that was made in a factory. Um, I don't think there's any reason necessarily to, to do that. Um, and that's that's the beautiful thing about uh, becoming more in control of your health is that most of the things that are within our control that make us unhealthy are completely optional. They aren't something that we have to eat or there's something that we can at least control the amount of and while you know there's environments where you're not going to have very many options and maybe you'll occasionally have to uh, splurge and eat some of this stuff um, you can usually especially in your home environment you can keep the stuff out of your home and and not be at least eating it while you're at home and with your family. And that's going to be one of the most important things. And of course it depends on your lifestyle, if you go out and travel a lot or or whatever. Uh, if you travel you've got another, you've got a, certainly a set of challenges ahead of you if you travel. Because uh, knowing what's in everything and knowing, you know, coming up with a routine to uh, be able to eat well while you're traveling and still be happy with it uh, is certainly a challenge. Uh, but it's it's been done. Uh, there's business execs. I think that bulletproof exec guy, for example, he travels around all the time, and uh, he manages to make, you know stick to his own uh, diet that he specially crafted for himself reasonably well, even while traveling frequently. Okay, so I want to talk for a little bit about the um, influences that. pervert the, um, the health of many people um, who rely on the system and who trust the system. And uh, the entry points for this, this flawed information, um, just so you're aware, um, you know, obviously any in-depth uh, information, would, you know, there's so much out there that you need to just start looking at it on your own if you're not already. But um, Based upon my understanding, of course, um, it starts in the government, uh, starts in the uh, regulatory environment, the regulatory apparatuses. They are basically just trying to help the uh, the players that are already in the market, who already control the most most of the market. Uh, they have. Uh, you know the revolving door phenomena basically where you have people going back and forth and that's what kind of sets the tone for things and this happens of course in the FDA uh, with Big Agra and all that kind of stuff um, if something that's commonly done is not healthy it's gonna take a long time if ever before it comes out uh, before anybody from these organizations is going to say anything about it. They'll come up with all sorts of excuses as to why it's fine and, you know, kind of like with tobacco, for, for instance. Uh, tobacco was just fine. You were a quack if you didn't, um, you know, if you thought there was a problem with it. Doctors smoked cigarettes, you know. It's commonplace. Uh, but there were a few of those pseudo-scientific quacks who thought that there was a problem with uh, tobacco and made a fuss over it. Um, so that's that's certainly one area, uh, the, the various regulatory organizations that um, are regulating food and uh, medicine and, and things of that sort. And then the thing that I think people don't realize is that the med schools and uh, the doctors who practice uh, your even alternative medicine in many cases um, they are not really that 
well versed in nutrition. They're they're only given a small amount of of nutritional um, courses, um, and of course it's going to be you know government nutrition. I would I would guess in these courses, so be learning the uh, whatever the current fad is, the food pyramid or what have we. So they're not going to know unless they just have a passion and an interest in it. They're not necessarily going to know what to tell you. Uh, they'll tell you what they know uh, based upon probably what's the common conception of things, and usually that's wrong. So just listening to a doctor's advice, even though they're supposed to be an expert and know all this stuff about the human body, isn't always going to cut it. Um, I'm sure there's many out there who are awesome and understand uh, nutrition and take a special care to understand, you know, how to get around the, the idiocy and, and the whole, um, you know, all the misinfo and the idiocy. But um, I think that most of them are going to be probably acting on some very old information. Um, I mean, I've, I've met and talked to doctors who still think that, that saturated fat and cholesterol are bad for you. And uh, they were f relatively young and bright and intelligent. So, uh, um, one thing you know about these guys is they're they're busy. You know they they're busy doing their running their business. And uh, I think a lot of times they uh, they go to school and then they get out and then they're just working their ass off uh, for years and don't always uh, focus on things like that. Uh, I mean, in fact, it, you're a, an average. Uh, allopathic doctor, you know, drugs and surgery kind of doctor, it's going to be more interested in uh, prescription drugs than anything. And, and that's an area that I personally think is uh, worth avoiding, if at all possible, is uh, getting involved in, uh, in drugs, <laughs> getting involved in these uh, drugs that they want to give you. Uh, I think there's almost always alternatives that are completely natural and uh, non-drug-based. Uh, uh, course there may be situations where it can help but I think a lot of times it doesn't. So typically a, a doctor of your average stripe is going to recommend for most conditions drugs and surgery. Um, that's what they're taught to do and that's probably what many of them believe in doing for, for almost everything and in fact for uh, certain things um, like cancer um, if they make recommendations other than chemo or surgery or things like that even if they believe very strongly in that and have uh, evidence of, to back it up they will very well face sanctions and uh, possibly be drummed out of their profession um, lose their license, be pretty much uh, unable to, to practice medicine inside the country without a lot of legal uh, bullshit. And as a result, many doctors have actually um, left the United States, especially, which is one of the worst um, in, in terms of health freedom. Um, uh, it's even worse, I guess, in Canada because you can't even necessarily legally practice medicine uh, in a private practice up there. Um, although I think some do, anyways. But uh, in the United States, the FDA, you know, if you have uh, a cancer treatment center and you're not, you know, doing the uh, chemo and um, basically part of the establishment, you know, they will um, they'll shut you down and possibly arrest you and cause you all sorts of grief so many times people end up going to places like Mexico for this um, now you know I'm not saying that chemo is necessarily bad I mean there's I'm sure many people have been saved by chemo I don't know I'm not trying to say one way or the other I'm just saying there's there's alternatives to cancer treatments like their Gerson therapy and there's uh, experimental uh, drug therapies and uh, things that just don't ever, you know, they take so much money and so much time to get through the regulatory apparatus that uh, 
you know, you just don't have access to it, even though it may be working. Uh, even if you wanted to voluntarily do it, they would say, well, it's not approved by the FDA. So you can't, you know, even though you're going to die anyways, like let's say you've got some kind of terminal cancer, hey, if you're going to die anyways, either you die from radiation, you know, burning you from the inside out, or you die from some treatment that doesn't work. But really it should be, you know, obviously your choice. But they would rather shut people down because they want to protect us. The reality is that... Uh, I think the true purpose of it is not to protect anyone, although many, maybe many of the agents who do this kind of stuff, maybe that's what they have in mind, but the uh, overarching uh, reality, I think, is that they're trying to protect the industry and trying to keep um, the small group um, who currently has the money uh, to keep the business going their way and to keep the uh, public trust and to... Um, just keep keep it going, you know, because it's a multi-billion dollar industry. You know, cancer treatment is a very uh, pricey thing. And uh, part of that's because of uh, patents and intellectual property laws that uh, artificially limit supply and, and give people monopolies. Um, but also, you know, part of it's just because comp competing... Um, possibilities are not allowed and they use their uh, clout and their uh, perceived authority to make it seem like there's nothing to any of that stuff and and doing so they're able to uh, steer a lot of people into the uh, the industry um, and then it gets even worse in that um, you know dumping your money into the insurance pool you're paying your thousand or so dollars a month to to have insurance for your family and that uh, then controls what you can spend it on. Obviously, they're not going to let you spend it on uh, anything that they don't want. And these uh, insurance companies have uh, boards that are staffed by, you know, doctors and the AMA and, and whatnot who are quote-unquote experts. And they get to decide what is allowed to have uh, insurance coverage. And, you know, it may vary from area to area how this is all done and decided, but more or less you've got these, uh, this kind of incestuous relationship between these, these groups who um, get to decide what is considered uh, able to be covered by the money that you paid them to cover you with. Um, and so if you want to have choices and you want to have options, you've got to pay for any of it out of pocket. So that makes it even harder. So you're already, you know, now in the United States, uh, as especially your, uh, and, and in other areas too, you're forced to pay for insurance. So um, you either pay the tax or you pay the insurance. And so the money is coming out of your pocket and uh, you just, if you don't want to, you know, if stuff isn't effective and you don't want to use it, then you're still paying for it anyways. Um, just in the off chance that maybe you'll get hurt in a car accident or something and you'll need them to patch you up, but generally aren't using it. And so it's just, money going straight into them to help perpetuate the, uh, the system. And that's, that's one of the biggest problems is there's so much money in uh, medicine and, and in all these uh, food, you know, in the food industry and whatnot. And uh, not that money is necessarily bad, uh, but that money and heavy uh, involvement from the government is a real problem because you have... Uh, the ability to to really corrupt and pervert things. I mean, if there was real competition and there was real, uh, you know, some real kind of competition, uh, genuine competition, you couldn't have these artificial monopolies and artificial, you know, oh, he's not allowed to sell his treatments here because he's not approved by the FDA. If you didn't have that kind of crap, uh, I think you'd have a completely different landscape in the health, uh, health and wellness sector, and I think there it would much better serve people's health. Uh, but as it is right now, you know, you've got a, you've got very few options if you don't want to use that system, and that system is somewhat corrupt. Um, it's good at treating, you know, like acute problems or trauma, you know, like you get into a car accident or um, something of that sort where you have just a, a serious injury. But uh, when it comes to uh, chronic illnesses and uh, 
things of that sort, you know, you're you're not going to be they're not going to handle that very well. So, what does it take to be healthy in the modern <clears throat> in the modern day? I mean, it's always been a challenge. Uh, many of the uh, doctors throughout history have been, especially in accepted you know medicine. There's been serious issues. You know, when you've got these big institutionalized systems, you're going to have serious problems. Um, you know, in the early days of the uh, of America, for example, uh, it was quite frequent for doctors to use mercury as a tincture, as a, some kind of a cure-all, and um, I'm sure that was, uh, you know, people were just totally unaware of that, and they just took it and thought they were going to help them get better from their colds or, or whatever, and they didn't realize they were killing their brain cells and causing uh, problems, and I guarantee you there are many things like that happening right, you know, to this day. I mean, there's a number of drugs that have been widely prescribed that have killed tens if not hundreds of thousands of people and uh, based upon some uh, there have been some studies done on uh, avoidable medical mistakes and errors uh, uh, just not even following their own procedures and, and they found that uh, doctors and drugs are killing you know thousands of people every month it's one of the leading causes of death. Uh, you know, depending on how you do the stats, you know, you, you find that, you know, in a very liberal estimate, you, they're probably the leading cause of death. Uh, in a more conservative estimate, they're in, in the top five. So, you know, even just following their own procedures uh, and doing things the way they do, uh, they're still killing a number of people. Now imagine if you apply a higher standard to that and um, all the uh, disease that could have been avoided by having a better understanding of nutrition and things of that sort, uh, it's probably uh, way up there. Um, that's really sad that many people are dying uh, or suffering unnecessarily um, because there's a system that is so entrenched and so stagnated in many ways um, due to the um, all the inner you know the interfacing with the government and the uh, all the money that just is uh, woven into this kind of crony capitalist type system that is not a free market system at all it's just kind of a a welfare system of sorts in, in many ways um, it's a corporate welfare system and it also is a job program it produces all these excess jobs, uh, just filing claims and doing things of that sort. Uh, if it were more of a free market system, I, I would imagine that it would be more of a cash system and there would be a lot less bureaucracy because uh, you would have more, you know, more of a say as a customer. It would be more a relationship between you and a provider. And maybe there would be insurance options and whatnot, but I don't think it would be quite as... Uh, I mean, for instance, if you think about the insurance system right now, generally there's a um, like a monopoly of certain group of a small group of providers in each state, and they don't compete across state lines. Uh, if you had things, if it was like auto insurance where you could go switch every week, the rates would be much lower. The uh, it'd be much more appealing options. Um, I mean, I, for instance, I switched. Um, my home insurance, uh, I switched everything actually a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago. And in doing so, I, um, I not only got lower deductibles, I also got higher coverage amounts and uh, a much lower premium. I'm saving like something like $700 a year on just one of the houses I was insuring. And uh, the auto was almost exactly the same. Um, if not less, for way more coverage and for uh, half the deductible. So it's like no-brainer right there. Uh, and the reason it happens is because these people are competing with many other providers for the services, whereas these insurance companies, 
you know, like I have Blue Cross, you know, this insurance company, uh, everybody wants Blue Cross. Uh, it's all this, you know, it's this giant bureaucracy and the providers all line up and try to get on the Blue Cross preferred and then they uh, set, they get to fix the prices and these providers don't compete on the basis of price. So you have these different doctors who all charge the same price and so what are they going to do to compete? What Maybe uh, make a nicer waiting room or have little perks here and there. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, when you can't compete on price, that's a big aspect of things of, uh, as far as keeping the price of services to a, a good market rate. Uh, you, you've got these, basically you've got bureaucrats deciding what the price of everything is going to be rather than the market. And it's bound to make things more expensive than they need to be or less expensive than they need to be. And then you end up with shortages. So it's a huge problem. Um, so, you know, to navigate the environment, you of course have to understand its inherent, uh, the inherent corruption of much of what is in place in society to, to help you take care of your health, to understand where its strong suits are, you know, where it can be very useful. I mean, if I get hit by a car, I'm certainly not going to the acupuncturist. Um, I'm going, you know, or the herbalist or something like that. I'm going to the hospital to get my bones set and to get, you know, the initial problem, get the bleeding stopped and get the problem fixed. Uh, but dealing with the chronic pain and all that kind of stuff, I might go to an acupuncturist or an herbalist or some other practitioner of alternative uh, medicine. Um, so, you know, you've got to figure these things out. You've got to research on websites like uh, I use Mercola.com. Uh, I, I'm always critical of what he says, but I tend to find that he's got a perspective that I agree with. And uh, I know a lot of people maybe don't like him for whatever reason, but I haven't found there to be many problems um, with the guy. Um, everybody's got to be a perfectionist, but... Uh, He's right on most of the major things, and I think that uh, you've just got to learn how to do your research. You got to figure out. You got to read websites. You got to, you know, try to absorb as much info as you can, uh, and from you know different sources. Always, you know, keep an eye out for new sources, new books, new info, and uh, if you always uh, are looking far and wide, you'll eventually find, you know, sources that you can rely on and you, that you can follow and trust. And uh, if you do um, continue to uh, follow them, you'll be, I think you'll be surprised. Like I've been on Dr. Mercola's newsletter for, I don't know, probably five, seven years or something like that. And um, in the process, I've learned a, a great deal about health. And, um, uh, I, you know, I'm kind of slow to adapt to things, so I'll find out some info and then I'll realize, oh crap, I'm, you know, I'm eating something that I shouldn't be eating. And it may take me, you know, months, if not a couple of years to really work it out of my routine and my habits. But, you know, if you can slowly but steadily change uh, your habits uh, and listen to your body and see how it affects you, then uh, you can make some long-term uh, gains in your health because it's really what you do in the long run that matters. Anyways, you know, you could you could stop eating all your uh, all the junk food for a week cold turkey, and you'd be really likely to go back to eating it a month later or a couple of months later. Uh, but if you gradually and steadily uh, make changes, and you're always got the intent and the understanding of what you're doing then uh, you'll find that uh, you're able to, uh, to really make the changes stick because that's, that's the hard part is uh, you, know, you can understand something temporarily, uh, but a lot of times there's a, an attention span issue where um, you'll make a change and then you'll just forget about it and move on to something else. But you've got to keep that intent there. You've got to figure out what it is you need to change, what it is you need to do, and uh, make that change stick. 
And uh, you know, as far as you got to find providers of, uh, I mean, if you do need help from outside, uh, some kind of expert, you got to find people who can help you. Um, chiropractors, you know, doctors, herbalists, acupuncturists, whatever you choose to do, whatever suits your, your situation and your needs and your preferences. Um, you can't just go into any old doctor's office and expect to be getting valuable info. Sometimes that info can kill you, you know, especially like if you have type 2 diabetes or something like that, you know, they can <clears throat> put you on a, a regimen that uh, can really make you go downhill fast. So, you know, that's one of the problems with licensure is that people think that just because somebody has a license, they know obviously the person probably had to work a lot, you know, work hard to get it, but uh, it doesn't mean they necessarily know what they are talking about and that they won't cause you harm. Uh, you know, there's this kind of inherent uh, trust that uh, just because somebody has a, a license in something that that means that uh, your odds of uh, getting hurt are, are slim. And uh, no, there may be a liability that kind of uh, weeds out certain obvious situations, but uh, you can be slowly killed pretty easily and <laughs> nobody ever take responsibility for it. It's the, uh, it's the, sudden, uh, it's the sudden death that uh, is easy to trace back. But there's a lot of things that can happen as a result of uh, just poor medical decisions that uh, never get tacked on anyone, never get traced to anyone. Uh, and, uh, and that's why a lot of the, think the food that's being served is, is being eaten and uh, a lot of the medical practices are being done because uh, it's hard to pin it on anyone. It's hard to uh, trace it back and it often takes years of research to, um, to really do that and a lot of money. And um, so it doesn't tend to happen for a long time. A lot of people end up kind of getting uh, swallowed in the purring of, of their engines in the process. So the last area I'd like to really get into, um, aside from the, uh, the diet and uh, medical stuff, are um, things that you can do just in your, uh, you know, activities that you can do to um, help keep you out of the doctor's office and keep you healthy. Um, it seems like, you know, some of the activities that have worked really well for me, I think uh, that work well for a variety of people, uh, particularly is uh, yoga. And if you do yoga, you're, you're getting a variety of benefits from it. You're, of course, getting exercise. It's not high impact exercise, so you're not, as long as you, you know, do it properly and you're not, you know, damaging your joints or anything like that, you're, you're getting uh, a great deal of muscle tone and exercise and uh, staying in shape. If you have weight problems, you would be potentially losing weight, uh, gaining flexibility, uh, reducing your, a lot of people have uh, helped themselves with uh, problems where they have pain and inflammation and you know practicing yoga and things of that sort on a regular basis can uh, keep a lot of uh, diseases at bay um, it can give you a much more positive outlook on life and a you know just better quality of life in general and keep you out of that system because that's really what you want to do is you want to minimize your contact with that system and uh, I also personally do Tai Chi and uh, I get a great deal of benefit from it. It's great in uh, stress reduction and uh, has uh, really helped me out tremendously. I've been uh, doing it since the 1990s and I've gone through periods during that time when I've stopped doing it for a couple of years and I tell you when I start doing it again I notice just how much it makes everything so much more serene and relaxed and all the stress kind of melts away and it's a stress that really um, if you don't deal with it it can cause you some problems over the long run. Uh, I mean there can be some advantages and benefits to stress but if you're just always stressed out it's going to 
manifest itself in your body in many ways and you'll end up with uh, just aches and pains and uh, possibly heart problems and uh, neurological problems and you know, and then that could translate into habits that are unhealthy for you because you're using habits to deal with the stress. Um, so if you can, you know, do holistically beneficial things like Tai Chi and yoga and whatnot um, and use those to help <clears throat> just improve your general health, then um, you'll have uh, a much healthier body to work with. Uh, You'll be flexible. Like I, I remember when I first did, when I first started doing yoga, I couldn't even uh, do like the crow pose, the one where you're kind of standing on your hands uh, with your your knees up on your elbows. Um, I remember it hurt like hell. It hurt my wrists, and it was like, how can people do this? And then they they did things like headstand and um, just even the basic poses. They were all. It was challenging. It was made me. Uh, I kind of ran out of breath while I was doing it, and I've seen a lot of people um, also take up uh, yoga who hadn't done it before or who haven't done it much and see how much of a challenge it is for them. And it's interesting to kind of look back and to think back because now I can do it easily. I can do that, and then I can do another hour of, of something like Tai Chi afterwards and, and be just fine. And it just shows me you know, the amount of endurance that I've picked up from that and, uh, you know, I'm just in a much more relaxed and open state than I was uh, years back before I started this. And, and this also translates into making, you know, when you do these kind of lifestyle things and you put yourself in a really optimal state of, of wellness, um, not only are you, of course, keeping yourself out of the doctor's office, but um, it makes whatever you do more effective because... Uh, a healthy uh, body and mind is going to be more uh, effective at whatever it does. So if you um, are trying to, if you're, you know, trying to make a living, you know, running a business or just doing your work or, or whatever you're trying to do, what kind of, whatever kind of projects or activities you're trying to do, it's going to be more effective uh, if you're healthier. So if you're, you know, if you're at a peaceful, you've got a peaceful state of mind, um, and you're you're not all stressed out, and you're not um, lacking in, you know, you don't have like nutrient and mineral deficiencies, uh, you know, like you've got all your major vitamins, and you've got what your body needs, you know, it can function. It's like an engine, you know, you're you're you don't want to put diesel into a gasoline engine, or put kerosene into a diesel engine, or you, know, you want to put the right fuel into it, and you want to to drive it the right way, and uh, and that's kind of part of knowing your body and listening to it, in doing things like um, like these activities I was mentioning um, teaches you to listen to your body because you're you're really just one with your body at that time. Like when you're doing uh, yoga, uh, for instance, you're just going through the poses and you're feeling everything that's in your body. You're feeling the tension that's in it. You're feeling what it feels like to open up and relax it, what it feels like to stretch it out, uh, where the little spots are that are problematic. And you're, you're just pushing all those limits and, and testing all those ranges. And uh, like in Tai Chi, you work really heavily on, uh, on genuinely deeply relaxing. They call it songing. And uh, when you're doing this, if there is anything, you know, you start to really learn how to relax. And then you, you learn, wow, there's like unconscious tension inside of me. Like, like I remember I, a few classes ago, my teacher was telling me that uh, he noticed, uh, I think in my right arm, I was keeping some tension in there. And I was like, oh, wow, you don't say. And I, and I was like, that has been there like all along. And I haven't noticed it. And I let go of it. And the next time I, I was doing my form in front of him, he was like, wow, this is remarkably better. And I think it was partially because there was just something that I was not aware of. I wasn't conscious of. And when I finally became conscious of it and let go of it, I became, you know, that much more in control of my of my body. And my progress started accelerating that much further. Um, you know, these kind of things, while they may seem, you know, many people probably think that those activities are 
irrelevant to other things, but no, I think they're completely relevant. So I think if you're, you know, like I, I do programming and, and things that are really um, cognitive, but, you know, if I'm, if I'm not feeling good in my skin, in my body, uh, and, and of sound mind, then um, I'm not going to be able to do a very good job. I'm, you know, if I've got, you know, my back's hurting and I've got um, all sorts of problems uh, health-wise and my blood sugar's going up and down and, um, you know, this is a problem that I think many, I've noticed many programmers have is because they, they sit in an office all day and a lot of times they eat office food and, um, and just eat uh, the normal foods that are, that are served. And uh, I think when that, happens uh, many of them end up just having a lot of problems and it's it's unfortunate uh, but it's very easy to do I remember when I first started in the office kind of environment uh, I I did much the same and I ended up just feeling really terrible and uh, that's that really prompted me to to make a lot of the changes and I'm glad I did because uh, I would probably be on you know medications right now if I if I hadn't um, or have just serious lacks of energy, um, but you know when you when you do get things optimized well in your health, you have the energy to do to make the decisions about about things. It's kind of like a, a snowball effect. Um, you know, you, you may be kind of hazy uh, when you're getting started, and it's hard to even make the right decisions. But you start to kind of uh, gain some momentum, and it snowballs and it's kind of like uh, it's like you've got a windshield with bird shit all over it, and it's hard to drive. And you gradually, uh, you know, you you try to clean it off, try to polish it, and you know, once you uh, eventually get all the crap off of it, you can see where you're going. And uh, once you can see where you're going, then you start to accelerate your progress. And you know, one one thing that um, I would uh, like to add before I wrap it up here is that uh, it in my experience it's best to go for the least invasive solutions that you can you know like if you have a problem it's best to start with the least invasive solutions and go you know work your way up uh, to more invasive solutions if you really must um, I know that many of the little aches and pains and problems that people have uh, that they a lot of times they just live with them and they end up having them for their whole life are repairable uh, without necessarily even having any sort of surgery or drugs or anything like that um, I don't know how many times I've seen you know people in uh, some of the classes I've done um, who have just been living they they just started the class and they've been living with problems their whole life and uh, a chiropractic adjustment or a you know Chinese bone setting or something like that um, fixes their problem or at least you know helps them with their problem um, many times if you go to a, a doctor about these problems they're not going to be aware of these other solutions and you know a, a surgical uh, or drug-based solution will be recommended um, Whereas if you can find a decent uh, chiropractor, not all, you know, obviously even chiropractors, uh, not all of them are good. Um, many of them um, just don't have the kind of intuition or the education to, um, to do a good job. So you've got to be careful with them, uh, just like anyone else. But, you know, I've, I've been helped by chiropractors in numerous ways. And I've had, um, you know, we have, the human body naturally gets misalignments and you know subluxations and um, various problems um, in our joints and in our vertebrae and our spine and our neck they, they just naturally get out of alignment and uh, there's not really for for many of these situations there's not anything you can do just by yourself you've got to have somebody who knows what they're doing to adjust it and Virtually every time I've had such a problem, I've been able to go to a chiropractor. Um, I found a really good one, um, and he fixes it, and it's fine. And the pain, whatever pain was related to it, goes away. Um, you know, like if you have your uh, atlas vertebrae, the one right below your the right below your skull that holds your your skull up, 
uh, if that gets out of alignment, it, it puts pressure on your brain stem, and then you end up with, you know, kind of cloudy headedness, and your your basically your body has to, uh, your head's not on straight, so your body, you know, twists itself around to try to make your head straight, and in process it, everything gets kind of out of whack because your body will try to stay in a certain arrangement, and if the actual um, skeletal um, alignments are off, it will contort things around to make that arrangement possible. And so that's why it, it can be very important to, uh, to get those adjustments. Um, you know, you don't want the nerves in your spine to be all pinched and, uh, and your vertebrae to be out of place. Um, you know, there's, like if you have a subluxation in, in your, um, what is it, in this, the middle part of your spine um, around the rib cage area, you can actually feel it in your ribs, and you can feel it when you breathe in. You'll feel a little pain when you breathe in, till you get it, till it go, either it goes back in place um, on its own, or or gets adjusted back in place. And um, you know there is some benefit to doing yoga in that regard, and that some of those uh, alignments can be kept and corrected uh, through doing yoga, or at least uh, kept for longer because you're keeping those muscles stretched out. You're you know breaking up that scar tissue and keeping those muscles stretched out uh, and uh, taking that stress out of your body so that you don't have the muscles always pulling everything out of alignment. Um, but, you know, as I was saying at the beginning of this point, though, um, I'm glad that I always opt, at least at first, for uh, the non-invasive uh, approach because I have managed to avoid surgery and drugs and uh, all sorts of potential uh, problems uh, and side effects uh, by doing that. Um, I've never needed it. I'm not saying that it's not, you know, ever necessary, but I'm just saying, you know, it's better to steer clear of it if you can. Um, it's kind of like, you know, if you're in a situation, you want to, uh, you know, avoid violence. You know, like if you if you have a, a disagreement with somebody, you you want violence to be the last resort. Well, you want violence to your body through the form of these drugs and surgeries and whatnot to be a last resort uh, because that is hazardous. You know, even if they know what they're doing and they're very skilled, you know, you are cutting into your body, you're putting anesthesia into your body, you know, in the event that you get a surgery, uh, for instance, uh, or with drugs, there's all sorts of, you know, side effects um, and they may not even really work very well. There may be even only a small percentage of, uh, you know, cases where they actually do work well, and that was their justification for saying that that drug even works. I think most of um, the effects of drugs, just my personal opinion, is that most of the effect of, of drugs is placebo effect. Not that the, you know, the placebo effect is a real thing. It's basically the mind's own ability to heal the body. Uh, you just kind of fool it into healing it because you take the pill or you go see the guy with the white coat and you think you're being healed, and so uh, really your, your own mind and body system is healing itself through belief. Uh, it's a very real thing and it's a very powerful thing, but, um, you know, if you can do it without the drugs, you know, then uh, all the better, right? Because uh, you're still getting the healing out of it, and if it was the placebo effect, then, uh, you know, the end result is still the same. You're still better at the end of it. Um, I think that's a very... Uh, misunderstood area uh, placebo effect is not useless you know even if you you get the placebo effect uh, you know you heal yourself with the placebo effect it's still um, you're still healed you know it's just not very well understood how that happened and I think it's just a, one of those things where the body itself uh, has the power to heal itself and uh, we just often think that we can't and uh, choose to only believe that we can when we go see the doctor or, or whatever. And so, you know, if you just try to uh, do what you can yourself, uh, then maybe you can actually handle much of it yourself. Uh, it's just a, uh, I think, a belief that many people have that they can't. And if you don't believe you can do something, then, you know, obviously whatever effect happens with this placebo effect is not actually going to uh, to work on you because you you don't believe that there's anything you can do. And until you get to, into a situation that you believe works, you're not going to get 
that uh, effect and that benefit. So I'm about out of time. Um, I just wanted to go over, you know, a basic intro to um, natural, you know, health or, or basically just taking your own health in, in, into your own hands, uh, however you might like to do that, even if you do like to use the drugs and surgery stuff, uh, just to be um, a critical thinker um, in that area uh, and understand that uh, while many people uh, involved in that system may, uh, may be in, in well-intended and well-meaning, that uh, they don't always, uh, they're not always aware of the factors that are deeper in the pipeline that uh, maybe affect the information that they have and, and uh, many of the decisions that have been made at a, a, a higher level that are kind of uh, perverted by the, uh, the whole uh, bureaucratic uh, apparatus that is uh, overlaying things that kind of makes, uh, makes many of these systems uh, very impersonal and uh, built to, uh, to benefit um, organizations that are uh, well entrenched in the system rather than uh, to specifically benefit uh, one's individual health. So I hate that that's the case, but um, you know, if we really want to be free uh, in this world, you know, at least in our lifetime, we got to be free in our bodies and uh, got to have a, a clear mind and a clear perspective and a healthy body and mind and we want to live a nice long life so that we can do our work in this life and be there for our families and our, our friends and uh, the only way to do that is to learn you know critical thinking and and to learn how to be in control of our own health and that's something that takes years to do and if you're not doing it I suggest that you do because uh, nobody's gonna take as good a care of you as you are and you'll be thankful. Your, your future self and your, maybe your kids, if you have them, uh, you know, when you get older, will be thankful because uh, the earlier you start, uh, the better your life will be in the future. Because you know, if you start making good decisions at an early stage in your life, you know, there's a lot of uh, damage that you can prevent. If you can prevent damaging yourself, you know, you don't want to spend decades damaging yourself and then try to heal yourself when you're already old and, and weaker. Um, but, you know, even if you have done that, you know, there's much benefit that you can derive from, from making that change. Um, you know, even if you've got a lot, of, a lot of problems, it's amazing the kind of turnaround that you can have if you really start to, uh, to go after these problems and really work on it. So... Uh, I guess that's it for this week. I look forward to uh, talking again next week.